Banks in Philly, Reforming Criminal Justice, a partnership between NBC10 and the Philadelphia Tribune. Here's NBC10 investigative reporter Claudia Vargas. Philadelphia is a city mired in poverty and violence. Thousands of its residents are sent to jail and prison each year. The overwhelming majority of them are black. According to the Philadelphia court system, 92% of the city's jail population in September were people of color. A generation of young people are hanging by a thread from becoming part of the bleak statistics. This is my first time, this is going to be my last time. They want better for themselves. Yeah, being in the system, it'll uh, mess your life up. But for people of color living in poor neighborhoods, the decks are stacked against them. Statistically, they're more likely to get stopped by police, more likely to get arrested, and more likely to be stuck in jail. Experts say racial bias permeates through every aspect of the criminal justice system, starting with the 911 call. Then you got bias at the dispatch, you got bias at the uh, officer expectations, you got um, the accumulation and response to that bias um, from the community members. Philip Goff is a Yale professor who has researched racial bias. He co-founded the Center for Policing Equity. Goff says even after an arrest is made, racism will continue throughout the judicial process. Then you got bias in terms of setting bail, um, the arraignment, um, the availability of indigent defense. We spent time with young men who were caught up in the criminal justice system, speaking with them about how the color of their skin has played a role in how police and the courts treat them. They all recount stories of being stopped by cops for minor infractions. Do you guys think that it's racial bias? I mean, do you think it's because of the color of your skin you're getting stopped? Oh, yes. Omar Khalil's love for bikes began at a young age. And it all started off on pedal bikes, and it just escalated from there. At 14, he moved on to motorbikes. The thrill of riding fast was addicting to him. I'm not harming anybody. It's not like I'm around shooting anybody or I'm around selling drugs or anything. I'm on a dirt bike riding around the city, just having fun with my friends. But what seemed like harmless fun quickly got him in trouble at 15. And as soon as I seen the helicopter, that's when my heart dropped because that was my first actual encounter with the police. Police chased him and charged him with reckless endangerment, driving without a license, and other felony charges. Felony charges for running a dirt bike. He says his case was handled in juvenile court and the charges were eventually expunged. At 16, he got another bike. Everybody's riding, why can't I ride? But police quickly put a stop to that bike as well. Omar says the judge for that case sent him to a drug and alcohol program instead of jail time. I'm 16 years old with 30, 40, 50 year old men that's like drunk, like in the drug and alcohol program. He says he wasn't drinking or on drugs and needless to say, he didn't find the program helpful. Criminal justice reform advocates say that diversionary programs should be tailored to the individual. Putting meaningful interventions on the front end or doing more of an individualized assessment of people on that very early stage. If not, they risk falling into a cycle. After his two run-ins with the law, Omar dropped out of high school. He would land in adult jail soon after. One night last year, Omar drove to three of his relatives' pizza shops throughout the city with what he says was a BB gun. He tells us he went in shouting and breaking things. The criminal complaint, though, says he also stole money. Nobody never got harmed. Um, I was really just, just going in there just because I was mad. It was really out of anger, to be honest. He was charged with robbery, simple assault, terroristic threats, and carrying a gun without a license. That sent the 18-year-old to jail. According to court records, his bail was set at $675,000. To get out, he would need to pay 10%. There was nobody that's going to come out of the pocket and paid. While in jail, Omar says he met people who were there for their 10th or 30th time. They told him he would be back just like them. I'm sitting here looking at the man like he's crazy. But it's not so crazy. Recidivism is real. Statistics compiled by the Philadelphia Reentry Coalition show that 44% of 18 to 24 year olds who were incarcerated will be rearrested within one year of their release. Recidivism rates go down with age. And when broken out by race, African Americans of all ages had a 33% recidivism rate. 28-year-old Nate Robinson is part of those statistics. Robinson's first experience with the criminal justice system didn't happen until he was 25 years old. According to the criminal complaint, he went into a store and stole a cell phone case valued at $15.99. I got court and they met me at the door. I was upset, I started fighting. Prosecutors charge him with robbery, 
terroristic threats, and assault. His bail was set at 10000 Tax return just came, like two days when I was in quarantine, and I called my girl, I said, baby, bail me out. Robinson had been driving school buses and trucks for a living, but he says he was addicted to Percocets. He tells us a doctor prescribed him those for lumbar scoliosis. I was under the influence. The district attorney's office and judge agreed to place him in a diversion program for first-time offenders known as ARD, or Accelerated Rehabilitation Disposition. That's like the easiest thing they could give somebody that's in trouble. All he had to do was some community service and stay out of trouble for two years. His record would have been expunged. I ain't take the initiative to complete that. He didn't think it was serious at the time, but now regrets it. Do you wish that there would have been something Nobody different? Nobody reached out. He went on to say that if someone was assigned to his case and coached him in some way, perhaps he would have stayed on track and out of trouble. Instead, he started selling drugs in Kensington. Dope. Dope and fit and all. Police arrested him in December, and Robinson was charged with intent to deliver. He was released on $5,000 bail. That case is still outstanding. Yale professor Philip Goff says drug arrests are usually a prime example of systemic racial bias. He cites college campuses as an example of where drug use exists, but police aren't as aggressive. We haven't decided that that illegal behavior is as dangerous as the illegal, the exact same illegal behavior, right, in majority black neighborhoods. Keir Bradford Gray leads the Philadelphia Public Defenders Association. She says she has witnessed the racial bias firsthand. In court, she has defended black and brown teenagers, sometimes even preteens, for drug possession or stealing from the corner store. It's very rare for us to even have someone who is Caucasian as, as a child in this system, unless they're charged with something extremely egregious. She says the kids in predominantly white high schools get other types of interventions. They went to their counselor. Robinson says he didn't have positive role models to keep him on the right path. After he was released from jail, he went back to Kensington. There, he illegally bought a 25 caliber handgun for $200. Got into a fight, a scuffle, and I felt as though the only way I could protect myself is if I carry a firearm. Sad to say, but... It, now, does that mean that you'd be willing to, like, shoot somebody in self-defense, or what? For sure. But then don't you think you'd be charged with, like, murder or something? I mean, for there's that risk, right? So for sure. And why lot, bother having the gun? I'd rather be judged. You heard that saying? I'd rather be judged by 12 than be carried by 6. What Robinson is saying is that he would rather go to trial for shooting someone than end up dead and be carried out by pallbearers. It's a grim look at life, but it's one we heard from other young men living amid the city's increasing gun violence. Cops arrested Robinson in March for illegal possession of a firearm. His bail was set at $75,000. I never shot no gun. That was my first time purchasing a gun. Robinson's criminal history was a factor in the bail decision. He thinks race played a role as well. Do you think any of your cases would have been different if the color of your skin had been different? Yes, yes, yes. Robinson had $3,200 in the bank, but even that wasn't enough to get him out of jail. So he sat behind bars, all while COVID-19 took a grip of the city's jails. My mom said she was praying for me every night. I call her crying. Every time I call her. District Attorney Larry Krasner tells us racial bias is unavoidable in the criminal justice system. There's still prosecutors who have a lot of discretion. It's part of the job who don't even know why they feel like one defendant should be treated better or worse than the other. He is implementing implicit bias training for the DA's office. Krasner went on to tell us that when he was a criminal defense attorney, he would overhear prosecutors during arraignment hearings. He says those prosecutors would talk about cutting a young man a break because he came from a good family. And if you listen a little longer, you'd find out a good family was one where his father was a firefighter or uh, he had a relative who's a police officer, or they lived in the Northeast. And while the racial bias may not be as overt as before, Krasner says, it still exists among prosecutors, defense attorneys, bail magistrates, judges, and juries. For two young people who've acted identically, the prior record may look worse for someone who is poor uh, and may look worse for someone who is of color. Someone's prior record might be a result of the frequency in which that person is stopped by police. If you have certain neighborhoods where a kid who has a bag of weed in his pocket is liable to be stopped and frisked, often illegally, four or five times and get caught three times, 
and have three weed possession cases. Krasner says that wouldn't likely happen to a white affluent kid who is carrying some weed in his pocket. And Philly PD's own stats show that 80% of vehicle and pedestrian stops citywide are people of color. Police have generally defended the high percentage of black people who are stopped by saying that they are simply stopping people where there is high crime. Goff says that's not a good enough excuse. I think that we've used this, oh, well, they go where the crime is, as a cover for the fact that there's a lot of folks who on some level believe it's really okay to people, treat people who live in majority black and brown communities differently. Those stops can easily end up in arrest, and then a criminal record starts building. Prior records are used in the next step, determining bail. We know most African-American people come in contact with police more frequently, and so it would drive a disparity in terms of a bail guideline for that community versus others. Coming up on Race in Philly, reforming criminal justice, we look at the controversial cash bail system, the magistrates setting them, and consequences of not being able to pay. Race in Philly, reforming criminal justice, a partnership between NBC10 and the Philadelphia Tribune. Here's NBC10 investigative reporter Claudia Vargas. Oh, uh. With two kids at home and a third on the way, Nate Robinson says he could have been more productive at home if he wasn't stuck in jail, unable to pay his cash bail. You got limited resources while you're sitting in jail. While you're out on bail, you could, you know, talk to these people, probably find a job, make some money to pay your lawyer. Cash bail is the amount of money a person accused of a crime has to pay in order to get out of jail. That money is supposed to guarantee the defendant returns to court. Once the case is resolved, the defendant gets the money back. But if the person can't pay, they sit in jail. There's a much larger number of people who really don't need to be in jail. In a city like Philadelphia, where 26% of people live in poverty, and where, according to the Defenders Association, nearly 90% of defendants can't afford their own attorney, not many people can afford to post bail. Some people may lose jobs, housing, even their kids because of it. Racial bias expert Philip Goff says that sometimes defendants will take a plea deal simply to get out of jail, even if it means having a criminal record or bringing on probation for a number of years. We're holding people who are poor because they're poor, and then we, we give them criminal convictions because they didn't have the money to not be poor. Like if that doesn't outrage you, I don't, I don't know where your where moral instinct is. It's fundamentally corrupt. District Attorney Larry Krasner campaigned on ending cash bail. The use of cash in bail is an incredibly racist system. Krasner says Pennsylvania law doesn't allow courts to simply not have bail. The best we can do in Philadelphia under our current system is to try get, to get rid of these bails that are in the middle. The middle bails, according to Krasner, are the ones that are high enough that they're keeping people who don't need to be in there in jail and the ones that are low enough that bad guys can pay and get out. Defendants who are not dangerous to the community. More and more, we are succeeding in having them get out of jail without having to pay any money. The people making bail decisions are court magistrates. They're different than judges, they're not elected, and they don't need to have a law degree. The magistrates run the arraignments. Those are the first court hearings held hours after an arrest to determine whether the defendant should be incarcerated and if bail is needed. We just gave you bail not knowing if you could afford it, not knowing what your circumstances were. And that has set you on a path now to lose so much more than, than you've gained. Joe Capone, once a bail magistrate himself and now oversees them, says magistrates have to balance what the DA, police, and defenders request, plus a defendant's history. They will ask questions from the court risk management system and plug in answers. The questions are extensive, you know, from you know, where do you live? Who do you live with? Do you have a spouse? Uh, you know, what's your criminal history? Do uh, you have children? Uh, do you go to school? What's your degree? The system is supposed to determine the defendant's risk in returning to court. The chief defender tells us much of the system is antiquated. For example, not having a landline is taken as being higher risk for not returning to court. So the bail amount or the bail guideline may be higher. Well, these days people don't have landlines. Capone understands their frustrations. They're working diligently to uh, update that and reform it and then, you know, come into some better system. Capone spoke to us just weeks after the state Supreme Court ruled that Philadelphia's cash bail system is essentially sound and run in accordance with the law. 
The ACLU and other organizations sued the court saying defendants weren't getting due process in their arraignments. They argued that court magistrates weren't following bail rules. Bradford Gray says the system's questions usually lead to a higher bail for black and brown people. They're overrepresented in our criminal justice system for things that are more minor. If either the public defender or the DA feels strongly about a bail decision, they can call for a municipal judge on appeal that day. The public has to be protected and uh, the rights of the accused as well to get out. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a heavy burden. But that heavy burden lasts almost 10 minutes. Then it's on to the next case. You're confident that the five to 10 minutes that it takes to make that decision is sufficient? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, uh, 10 minutes, if it's a serious case, yeah, you need every bit of the 10 minutes you need to talk to the arrestee. But Omar tells us none of the three magistrates who arraigned him after the family pizza shop crimes engaged with him. I feel like they just, they just judged me off of just the paperwork. Aside from reforming the cash bail system, Philadelphia officials are looking at other criminal justice solutions. Some of the main goals include lowering the prison population, reducing the time a case takes to be processed, and decreasing the racial and ethnic disparities in the local justice system. Last year, the Defenders Association created a pre-entry coalition. It's a network of community programs that offer mentoring, training, or rehabilitation to defendants awaiting trial. When people are empowered, they respond better, and they're better for their communities. But sending someone to a diversionary program is not up to the Defenders Association. That decision is up to magistrates and judges. Coming up on Race in Philly, reforming criminal justice. We take you to a program that's working to get people jobs, not jail time. Race in Philly, reforming criminal justice. A partnership between NBC10 and the Philadelphia Tribune. Here's NBC10 investigative reporter Claudia Vargas. Jermaine Womack runs the Philly Auto and Parole Shop on Woodland Avenue in Southwest Philly. You know the fluid is full. The shop has evolved from a traditional car shop to a teaching and mentoring spot for people trying to straighten their lives. It's a hands-on program. It's an opportunity to create jobs in the community and get to know the people in the community. Philly Auto and Parole is one of the Defenders Association's partners in its pre-entry program. Maybe their first offense and the judge might look at them and say, hey, they deserve a second chance. We'll put them through this program. Womack knows from experience. When he was in his mid-20s, he landed in jail with a bail he couldn't afford. And didn't change my life. When he got out of jail two weeks later, he went straight to his father's mechanic shop. While working there, he taught his friends to change tires and other basic mechanic work. So it just clicked in the head like, hey, you could create something to help your friends and help people. We spent the day at the shop and spoke with the young men and women going through a 12-week apprenticeship-like program. One of the young men is Omar Khalil. While getting sentenced for the family pizza shop robberies, Omar says the judge asked him about himself. He was shocked. So I started telling her a little bit about my, about my mechanic skills from the past and what I'd like to do. So she referred me to this amazing program. She sentenced him to two years house arrest and five years probation. She also sent him to Philly Auto and Parole. I feel like this is the best thing that ever happened to me, for real. Omar had previously taught himself how to fix bikes and cars. Now he's learning the proper skills from Womack. Like 10 years and thank that man right there. One of the other young men who's in the program with Omar was sent as a condition of his parole. It was his first offense. The other young man enrolled himself in the program because he wanted to learn a skill. Hopefully we all could work together at the end of this so we can get some kind of a uh, shop going. Because you guys didn't know each other before this, right? Oh, yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, so, no. and now you're friends? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you Perhaps know, future, future people, business you know. partners? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> if the men complete the 12-week course, they get certified to be a vehicle repair professional. Womack says the funding for the program comes from various sources, including some of the local sports teams. But still, the idea of pre-entry programs is relatively new. Womack is hoping it catches on. If you want house arrest and just sitting home doing nothing, what, what, that, what do that do for you? If you're sitting at home on house arrest and you still don't have a job, you still don't have a, no training. But some don't even get house arrest, but bail and a jail cell. Womack says locking up people and having them sit in jail isn't helping reduce violence. 
He's seen the gun violence escalate in his neighborhood. We definitely have a problem that we need to fix. Yeah, and you think this is part of the solution? Yeah, creating jobs. Creating jobs and creating opportunities in the community. Ruben Jones is Womack's counterpart in West Philly. He's been mentoring youth since he returned from a 15-year prison sentence. Jones is the founder and director of Frontline Dads. It's an organization that mostly works with 10 to 18 year olds to try to prevent them from engaging with the criminal justice system. They have positive images to look up to, to identify with, to ask questions of, to engage with is important. The Defender Association asked Jones to extend its mentorship program to young men who are already in the system. One of those men is Nate Robinson. Robinson says it was Jones who worked behind the scenes to get his bail lowered from the initial $75,000 to $10,000. That was the best thing I heard. That lower bail allowed Robinson to get out of jail while he awaits a decision on his case. He says he has weekly Zoom meetings with Jones and his team to go over everything from his court cases to his life goals. They also make me realize like the, the, the court system and who I am as a man and what I gotta be doing out here as a man, like they, they, they get on me. Jones says bail and jail simply make people more desperate. Are you seeing a young person who has potential and has the ability to, to redirect their lives without the stigma of incarceration or placement when the community can intervene and support them, then why not utilize them? And it's not just releasing individuals, but connecting them with people or programs who can help them. When you got that first initial case um, two years ago, if you would have had somebody like Frontline Dads help you through that, do you think you, we, you wouldn't be here? I wouldn't be, hell no, I wouldn't, no, I'm sorry, excuse my lady. I would not be here. He went on to say that what he needed were role models. Omar now has Womack as a positive example, and Nate has Jones as a mentor. Both young men say they want to stay on the right path, but Nate still has three outstanding cases waiting to be decided on, including the illegal gun charge. So are you scared then? I mean, this is still an open case. Like, could you go to prison again for years? Yes, yes, yes. I'm walking on Asia. I don't, it's like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be so good, so nice. Man, in the boo-boo, I can't get who. Nate is spending time with his three children. He's also looking for a job in which he can use his CDL license. Meanwhile, Omar is spending time with his daughter. He is looking forward to being off house arrest. And he's already using his new skills to build a business. Now it's like, got money everywhere. <laughs> Fixing people's bikes, cars, um, just doing everything that I can get money basically. And I'm doing it. We'll say hi. For more information on Race in Philly, Go to NBC10.com slash race101.